Hello and welcome to this first session on orbitals. Um, so those of you who attended my previous set of sessions on atomic structure, we were looking at atoms in a really kind of basic simplified way using sort of classical sort of GCSE type physics and able to make surprising progress. In this series of sessions, I want to take a more modern approach. And this more modern approach considers the electrons as a wave and therefore we're going to describe them with a wave function and we're going to discover that this actually provides many benefits it's actually very useful to describe the electrons as waves and so what I'm going to do in this first session is just really concentrate on the wave idea looking at electrons at waves and look at some context in which it's very useful to look at the electron as a wave and so this slide here shows you the electron orbitals. So we're used to seeing electron orbitals. Um, we would think of them as regions of space where we're likely to find an electron and these being representative of a wave function. And I just really wanted to put the idea out there that we can think of these as waves, but standing waves. So the electron is, as it were, confined to this kind of pulsating, as it were, standing wave. So we're going to look at the orbitals as standing waves and see where this takes us. And I thought I'd start with a kind of musical analogy. And so you can see the diagram on the right here. Uh, so this is based on a guitar. And actually, this comes from a guitar website, I think. And so you have the vibrating the vibrating string here and so you can see that the string is fixed at either end and it's vibrating but as it vibrates there are these various possible harmonics you can have so at the bottom there we've got this kind of fundamental note and then as you go one up we are doubling the frequency halving the wavelength uh, then you can see the next one up it's going to be three times the frequency and a third of the wavelength and so we're stepping up through these harmonics of this standing wave and so we're going to consider electrons a bit like this as well where there are standing waves and a relevant thing here is relating the energy of the wave to the wavelength and so I think certainly through the equation e equals hf which you can write as e equals hc over lambda we're used to seeing this with light that as the wavelength gets shorter the energy of the photon gets greater and likewise we're going to see uh, in these depictions here that as the wavelength as the wavelength gets shorter of our string as we go up to these higher harmonics it's going to be associated with a greater energy and so as we go up this higher energy ladder, as it were, with these standing waves, what we're going to find is there are more nodes, of course. And so by a node, I mean a point on the wave where it passes through the zero amplitude level. So yeah, you can imagine if you draw a sort of horizontal line through the wave where it passes through zero, this is what we would call a node. And so one thing we can see, we can classify these waves actually by the number of nodes they have. And we can see that the more nodes they have, therefore the shorter the wavelength will be and the higher the energy will be of the wave. So these actually are quite relevant when we consider electrons and we'll be looking at nodes a lot more with electrons. And so an interesting point that comes drops out of this is that there is a limit to how long the wavelength can be. So you can see that we've got uh, these two sort of vertical uh, lines which represent the, uh, if you like, the boundaries of our, of our wave where the string is fixed. And so you can see that distance there at the, in, with the base fundamental at the bottom wave, that distance there will be half of the wavelength. And there's no way the wavelength can be any longer than that because there's no other way of drawing the wave so that it's fixed at each end there. And so that's quite an interesting fact that there's a limit to how long the wavelength can be. Now, looking a bit further at this point about standing waves, and in fact, as we're edging a bit closer towards the atomic case, here you see in the picture, I've drawn our standing wave going around a circle. And so 
this is beginning to look like an electron orbiting a nucleus now. And so, as we saw before, there is a minimum as to how low the energy can go, which is the same as saying that there's a maximum to how long the wavelength of the wave can be. And furthermore, because in our wave picture, um, the waves had to have these fixed points at the end, it meant that we went from one wave to the next in a kind of discrete step. In other words, the number of nodes, if you like, in the wave had to be a particular integer. And so it limited the allowed waves that we could go for. And we're going to see a similar thing here with the waves going around a ring. And it's interesting because even though it might seem bizarre at first sight, looking at the electrons as waves, actually it's terribly useful because a major problem that we had with atomic theory when Niels Bohr first came up with his model of electrons orbiting in shells, the massive objection was that it wasn't stable, a massive problem, because the laws of physics at the time, the basic classical laws of physics, said that such an electron orbiting around the nucleus, it would spiral into the nucleus. So it would emit radiation, it would lose energy, it would spiral in, so the atom would collapse. It wasn't stable. So it was a massive problem, the fact that the atom was observed to be stable. But using our wave picture, there is a lower limit to the energy of the electron. And so once the electron has got to that kind of fundamental wave form, it's simply not permissible for the electron, when we consider it as a wave, to go any lower in energy. And so it simply is forbidden for the electron to collapse into the nucleus. And this rescues the whole picture of the atom because we can now have a stable atom. So we can have a stable atom with the electron considered as a wave in a way that we couldn't considering the electron as a particle. Another very significant point is this thing about the discrete steps, having certain permissible waves depending on the number of nodes in the wave function. And this corresponds exactly to the line spectra that were observed at the time. So for, as you know, with the line spectrum of hydrogen, that you only see light emitted at very particular discrete frequencies that came out of these particular lines that were observed in the spectrum. Now, this was very mysterious at the time. There was, there was no really good reason why only permissible, particular p permissible energies of the electron would be observed. But this makes sense of it, because again, the wave picture only allows certain discrete solutions, certain discrete waves, and therefore what we observe in the spectra are transitions between these very discrete energy levels, which will give you a particular frequency of light. So that's a great thing about this wave picture. It explains line spectra, it explains quantization, it explains why atoms are stable at all. So really, it's actually very profitable to consider the electrons as waves. And then a last little teaser here with the boundary conditions. So on the previous slide, we had this, remember we had the string fixed uh, at both ends. But of course, in this particular standing wave, there is no end to it because it's simply going round and round in a circle. So does this have boundary conditions? So again, at first sight, you might think no, but actually, there is a kind of boundary condition. There's, if you like, there's a rule that we have to impose on the wave. If it's going to be a standing wave like this, then we would insist that if you do a 2 pi rotation, or if you like, a 360 degree rotation, then effectively the wave has to return to the same point. So the, the wave function at an angle theta or whatever would have to equal the wave function at the angle theta plus two pi. And this actually, this rule, so this will uh, limit the waves that are permissible, is considered a boundary condition, just like it was when we had the waves fixed at the end in more of an obvious physical boundary, it still counts as a boundary condition. So in a sense, the boundary condition is like a rule to which the wave function has to adhere. And then finally, what other boundary conditions might an orbital have? Well, looking at an orbital, well, 
we've got three dimensions of space and in fact we'll, we'll very often consider the orbital in terms of uh, two angles and a radius so ultimately as the radius goes to infinity the orbital wave would have to go to zero or else it would be a kind of meaningless function and also when we consider the other angle about which the electron could orbit the nucleus the same idea about adding 2 pi would, would have to pertain And so now, taking this wave picture a bit further, we get onto the idea of orbital phase. And so you can see the diagrams on the right hand side. We've got these orbitals or lobes of orbitals, which are either shaded a bit darker or they're white. And these reflect the so-called orbital phase. And so we might wonder, you've probably seen pictures of orbitals like this before, and you may have wondered what the shading represents. What's different about the lobes? that are different shades. Um, and so it's this thing about phase. Now phase is to do with the sign of the wave function. So when you see the wave function plotted on an XY graph, then when the function is a positive value of Y, let's say, then we'd call it uh, a positive phase. And when it's a negative value underneath the X axis, we'd call it a negative phase. And so again, when you think about a wave, normal waveform, in other words, the positive, you might consider it to be like the crest of a wave, and the negative part of the function you would consider being in a trough of the wave. So it's really crests and troughs in our standing waves. And so this is particularly significant when orbitals overlap with different orbitals. Because what's really neat about this is that when orbitals overlap with other orbitals, it's just like a wave interfering with or overlapping with another wave. And so if you've got the positive, a positive lobe from one orbital overlapping with a positive lobe from another orbital, this is a bit like the crest of a wave adding onto the crest of another wave, in which case the two would simply constructively interfere to give an even larger crest. And so when lobes of the same phase from orbitals overlap, we consider this constructive interference. So you get, if you like, an even bigger lobe at that point. And so in a bonding picture, when lobes of the same phase overlap, they can sort of add, add on to each other. And this is what we look at in a bonding interaction. And so you can see the top two interactions there both involve overlaps of the same phase. But the one beneath is a curious one with this s orbital and the px orbital. Because you can see in the kind of top half, you've got the same phase overlapping but in the bottom half that white lobe of the p orbital that will be opposite phase so it looks like you kind of got the top half as as a constructive interference the bottom half as destructive interference and actually by symmetry i think you can see there it's just going to cancel out so it's going to be neither constructive nor destructive it'll be just kind of neutral and this is what we regard as non-bonding and so you've got a little question for you at the end here. Suggest a type of orbital overlap that would give destructive interference. And what would be the result of that? So, for example, if we had two p orbitals pointing at each other where the lobes were of opposite phase, then you would have destructive interference where a positive lobe overlapped with a negative lobe. That's destructive interference. What's the result of that? Well, because the waves would add up to zero, you would have a region with no electron density in at all. So if you've got a region between two nuclei with no electron density at all, that just leaves the two nuclei looking at each other, as it were. And because the nuclei are both positive, with no electron density in between them, that just leaves the two nuclei to repel each other. And so that will cause the atoms to spring apart. And because the atoms spring apart, it's referred to as anti-bonding, because that's tending to break any interaction between the atoms. And so it would be called an anti-bonding interaction when you get this destructive interference. And so now we're going to take this a little bit further and start looking at the so-called molecular orbitals that you get when the atomic orbitals overlap.
and there's a link with energy and in fact this is a can be a very nice illustration of what we saw earlier and so of course we know that in general atoms do tend to combine together to form chemical bonds to form molecules and so clearly we must be stabilizing the electrons in some way because I mean this is how we define a chemical bond there'll be uh, energy released from lowering the energy of the electrons in the bond so somehow we're lowering the energy of the electrons and we're considering the electrons as waves so we can make some sense out of this so again looking at the diagram there we've got two 2s orbitals they're the same phase so they overlap constructively and so this is how we get our bond and so in the region between two nuclei we've got a pair of electrons this is what we mean by a covalent bond then uh, in the middle picture there we've got a, a 2s overlapping with a 2p so again they overlap uh, where the same phases meet each other so it's a bonding interaction constructive interference and similarly at the bottom where we've got two 2p orbitals they're lined up so the phases <coughs> are going to match up and that will give us another bonding interaction but let's look at this in a little bit more detail what's rather nice about this is that when the orbitals overlap to produce a so-called molecular orbital because that molecular orbital is spread across two atoms rather than one it's longer than it was before so it's a little bit like on our analogy with this string that the points if you like the edges of the wave are further apart than they were before we've got a longer wave when it's spread over two atoms so if you've got a longer wave spread over two atoms with a longer wavelength by lengthening the wavelength you are decreasing the energy and so it follows from our wave picture that as the atoms kind of coalesce and the orbitals overlap constructively the wave length of the electrons increases that lowers the energy and so by lowering the energy we stabilized the system so we've got the electrons in a lower energy and that constitutes our chemical bonding interaction so that's quite neat how this kind of molecular wave approach gives us our stabilization of energies that we're looking for and so that's this point this final bullet point here we get this longer wavelength and the lower energy now we're going to apply this idea to sort of the next level up which is this idea of a molecular orbital diagram and so on the slide at the moment we've got the simplest possible molecular orbital diagram and this is two hydrogen atoms coming together their 1s orbitals are going to overlap in a sense it's slightly unfortunate this because we show the 1s orbitals as, as just being say positive phase for example so you might think how on earth could the orbitals overlap in a destructive way but I think strictly speaking the way it works is when you combine orbitals you take linear combinations which means that you simply explore all the possible relative phases uh, perhaps another way of looking at it is you might say since a 1s orbital is everywhere the same phase it's slightly arbitrary whether you call it a positive phase or a negative phase it's a bit like a, a vibrating string one moment the string might be up positive phase the next moment it might be down negative phase so we can kind of define it in a way that we combine the 1s orbitals with the two possible relative phases and so if we had the two 1s orbitals overlapping in the same phase then again it's this idea that we form constructive interference molecular orbital the molecular orbital is longer than the atomic orbital so it goes lower in energy and this is what we see at the bottom of the diagram here where those two circles represent two 1s orbitals of the same phase overlapping this gives the system a lower energy state than was available in the individual atoms and so the electrons preferentially drop down to the lowest energy state it's a bit like this you might remember with the Aufbau principle so you remember when we look at all the atomic orbital energies in the atoms the electrons you know fill from the bottom 1s and go up we see the same sort of thing in molecules so the electrons drop down to the lowest possible energy and fill up from there so each hydrogen had one electron and so they end up pairing up in the bottom orbital so remember that with atoms 
we used to say that each orbital could take two electrons, one spinning up and one spinning down. And it's just the same in molecular orbitals. Each orbital can take two atoms, one spinning up, one spinning down. So those electrons go spin antiparallel, they drop into the bottom orbital. One thing we've explicitly got on this diagram is the so-called antibonding orbital. And this is at the top. So you can see here that um, we've got those two circles drawn next to each other showing opposite phases. So that implies destructive interference. And so again, it means that the, as it were, between the nuclei of the two hydrogen atoms, there is no electron density because they've can it's all cancelled out through the destructive interference. And so that just leaves the two nuclei to repel each other. So it's actually a higher energy state than having the two atoms separated and non-bonding. And that's why the anti-bonding orbital is represented by the highest line in the picture. So I should just make clear that you can see where it says HH in the middle there. That, rep that shows you that in the middle of the picture, those lines represent the orbitals in the HH molecule. And then if you kind of separate the atoms out to the right and to the left, you get the isolated atoms where it's just labeled H. And you can see on the far left there, we have an energy axis. And so that's why we depict the higher energy orbitals higher up on the diagram. Now, there's actually one quite subtle point that comes out of this. Um, and that's to do with, you can see the diagram isn't quite symmetrical. That looks a bit of a nuisance. I might have to say something about that. But perhaps before I do, one thing I would say is that if you look, consider the energy of the electrons. Um, so if you look at the molecular bit in the middle, you see there's a dotted line in the middle there. That is level with the atomic 1s orbital. So that's, if you like, the energy of the electrons at the start before the two atoms have come together. And so when the two atoms do come together, you can see that each electron drops down a little bit from the dotted line in the middle down to the lower orbital. So I suppose you would say, therefore, that the bond energy, the energy associated with that HH bonding interaction, will be the energy gap between the middle dotted line and the bonding orbital multiplied by two, because two electrons have gone down that gap. So that's one way we can read the bonding energy off a molecular orbital diagram. And so yes, coming to this point, you might expect symmetrically that the antibonding orbital will be the same gap above the dotted line. But it turns out when you actually do this calculation sort of algebraically properly, you do discover that in fact, the antibonding orbital is slightly higher. There's a slightly bigger gap to the non-bonding energy in the middle than there is stabilization. But that's kind of helpful in a way because supposing that it were totally symmetrical, what you could do then, if you excited an electron up from the bonding orbital up to the antibonding orbital, what you'd find then is that the overall energy was unchanged from the two isolated atoms. Because you'd have one electron at the lower energy, one electron at the higher energy, and the difference between the the central energy would just cancel out. And that would be slightly problematic because it would mean then that having excited an electron up to an antibonding level, that the that state would have the same actual energy as the isolated atoms, which might suggest that the two would be in equilibrium together. Whereas actually we know from experience that if you excite an electron into an antibonding orbital, it will break the bond. So it kind of it's quite nice in a way to show that the antibonding orbital is extra high in energy because it means then that if you excite one of the electrons in the molecule from the bond at the bottom to the antibond at the top, then the total energy of that excited state will be higher than the isolated atoms. So it makes sense then that the molecule would spontaneously decompose to the isolated atoms, which would be a lower energy state. So there you go, quite a lot of information packed into this diagram. Um, just a little point to note on the notation. So you see the two molecular orbitals there in the middle. You see they're both labelled sigma. That's the uh, Greek letter there, lowercase sigma. And so this is the uh, letter that describes the kind of head-on overlap that we see between the two orbitals. And in fact, the little g and the little u there, these are little symmetry labels uh, that mean even and odd. So this describes the symmetry of the interaction. So you can see, for example, in the bonding interaction, it's all completely symmetrical.
Uh, so in fact, if you were to reflect that picture through the center where those two circles touch, it would look the same as it did before. That's an even interaction. Whereas you can see on the antibonding picture, if you reflected it through the center, then you'd have the shaded lobe on the left and the, the white lobe on the right. So this would be that would flip it to a different arrangement. So that's why it's called odd. And so we find actually when we look at these things, symmetry becomes more and more important. And we we find lots of symmetry labels in these diagrams. So there we go. I covered that point, didn't I, about finding the bond energy. There we go. It's two times that gap from the middle to the bottom. Now, here's a much more complicated molecular orbital diagram. This is the diagram for oxygen. And so it follows similar principles that we saw before. There's just a little bit more going on. So what we have in this diagram is we've got all the valence electrons of oxygen involved. So oxygen in its outer shell, the second shell, is 2s2, 2p4. Obviously got six electrons altogether, like a group six or a group 16 element. And so on the, on the edges of that diagram, we see the six electrons in the outer shell of atomic oxygen. Then we overlap the orbitals. So if you like, the 2s overlaps with the other 2s. And so again, that gives you the lower energy sigma bond and then the higher energy antibond. So in this diagram, rather than using the G and the U notation, we see perhaps a more common way of showing it, which is using this asterisk to denote the antibonding. And so that would be pronounced sigma star, represents the antibonding sigma orbital. Things are a bit more interesting when the 2p orbitals overlap because there's two ways they can overlap. You could have two p orbitals pointing at each other and having the lobes overlapping head on, and that's our sigma interaction. And that tends to be quite an efficient type of overlap. And that's why the sigma is quite a big interaction. So the sigma drops right down and the sigma star goes right up. But the other thing, the other 2p orbitals, they won't be pointing at each other they'll be kind of parallel, sort of overlapping sideways on. And this is what the pi interaction is. You, you might have met this before, looking at alkenes and their second bond. And so the other two p orbitals can both do a sideways overlap. And so these two different orientations of sideways overlap give you two orientations of pi bond. And there's no difference between those different p orbitals, just a rotation. So those pi bonds come out the same energy. So we've got two pi bonds and it follows two pi antibonds where we've reversed the lobes of one of the atoms so that the overlaps are all destructive. So, so far so good. So, but you might be looking at that thinking, you know, this is a lot of work for what benefit? But actually there is a real benefit from this picture. And that is that there are some strange properties of oxygen that don't really make sense without this wave approach. And so let's have a look at some of these now. Oxygen is surprisingly reactive. It's sort of more reactive than you'd expect it to be. And you can explain that, I think, using this approach, because you can see that with these pi star orbitals at the top there, because there's two of those orbitals of the same energy, then the last two electrons that fill those preferentially go in separate orbitals. And of course, we saw this with the electrons in boxes when you're doing atomic structure. If you've got two electrons and two orbitals, the same energy, the electrons will preferentially go into different orbitals. Um, and so because those electrons are unpaired, that makes the oxygen a radical. And we, we rarely see unpaired electrons in molecules and they tend to be very reactive. So it actually works out here. It's a diaradical. So effectively, each oxygen atom in O2 holds one of these unpaired pi star electrons. So yeah, oxygen, particularly reactive. And you, when you look at the reaction mechanism for combustion, it kind of really brings home that you, you've got lots of radicals involved. And that makes it surprisingly reactive. So that's one bit of information that we wouldn't otherwise have realized. Because of course, when you do a dot cross diagram of oxygen, we draw all the electrons in pairs. So it's not at all obvious from a kind of dot and cross standpoint that you would have any unpaired electrons. But in fact, as I say, oxygen is a radical, a di-radical, strictly speaking. And that's made clear by the molecular orbital diagram.
Really bizarrely, oxygen is magnetic. Now, I mean, you'd never really guess just from you know breathing it in the air, for example. But one thing, it's great to see, you can look at this on YouTube. If you liquefy oxygen, uh, so you know, it's a pale blue liquid, I think, when you liquefy it, which is very dangerous, actually. So you, it's, you wouldn't commonly see this being demonstrated. But when you liquefy oxygen, this very reactive liquid really is magnetic. So you can actually pour it over magnets and you can see it will sort of line up with magnetic fields. So it's a very dramatic observation, this magnetism, which again makes no sense in the ordinary picture. But for magnetism, what you would want is unpaired electrons. And you can see that those two unpaired electrons, we draw them spin parallel, of course. And so what it means there, we've effectively got two little magnets. So a single electron of course, the electrons have spin and they've got charge and therefore they're little magnets and they're spin parallel. So rather than their magnetism cancelling out, which is what you normally get with a spin anti-parallel pair of electrons, those two little magnets add on to each other. So this diagram very neatly explains why oxygen is magnetic. Another bizarre property of oxygen is that if you ionise an electron off it, it actually makes the bond stronger. So you think taking an electron off a molecule would, would weaken the bonding, if anything, um, but bizarrely it gets stronger. And so this makes sense because when you ionize a molecule, you'll be taking off the highest energy electron first. The highest energy electron is in one of these anti-bonding orbitals. And you remember the anti-bonding electrons actually take away from the bonding interaction. So by getting rid of an anti-bonding electron, you actually strengthen the bond. And it's curious that if you move another electron to make it like an O2, 2 plus ion, the bonding is stronger still. Because you can see here that if you take a second electron off, again, ionizing the highest energy electrons first, you're going to end up losing both of those electrons upstairs there in the pi star antibonding orbital. So again, strange counterintuitive result, but actually makes perfect sense when you look at it in this molecular orbital diagram sense, which of course is considering the electron as a wave. And so it is quite neat here how we can also work out the bond order using the diagram. So of course, just using a simple GCSE picture, you would say that each atom wants two more electrons to fill its outer shell, and each electron is acquired through sharing one electron in a covalent bond. So it's fairly easy to come to the conclusion that it's a double bond using a GCSE picture. But of course, this is consistent because when you look at the orbitals, you can see we've got two sigma and two pi bonding orbitals that are full. So that looks like you've got four bonds. But then again, you've got this sigma star antibond and that effectively cancels out one of the bonds. So if you like, in the, you could almost forget about the 2s orbitals in this picture because they form a bond and an antibond and they're just going to cancel anyway. And then looking at the top there, you've got a pi star antibond, which is half occupied twice. And so combining those two electrons, those two half antibonds would make an overall antibond. And that antibond would cancel one of the pi bonds beneath it. And so once all that's taken into account, you'd have two bonds left over. You'd have a sigma and a pi from the overlap of the two p orbitals. So again, this diagram predicts a double bond, which is what we observe. And that's just what this last bullet point is about here. So this business about the bond order is all about looking at the number of antibonds, the number of bonds, antibonds cancel bonds. So you subtract the number of antibonds from the number of bonds, and that leaves you with the bond order. So there we go, quite a satisfying agreement there with our simpler pictures, but also adding some more information.